Hello, fans. It's the VC Andrews Critiquer. First off, congrats on getting your monetization back, Murray. I knew you could do it. But moving on, who would you guys say is the most famous non-American cartoonist? You are absolutely right. Hayao Miyazaki is the Walt Disney of Japan. But who's the second most famous non-American cartoonist? Okay, right again. Osama Tezuka practically invented the manga. But third... Okay, let me rephrase that. Who's the most famous non-American, non-anime cartoonist? I'll give you a hint. He's Belgian. <sighs> what is with you people? I'm talking about George Prosper Ramey. You know, Hergé, creator of Tintin. What, you guys never heard of Tintin? <sighs> Why can't people appreciate foreign media more? Okay, I guess I'm going to have to give you guys some context. Okay, so imagine if you were to mix together the Hardy Boys, Indiana Jones, James Bond, and for good measure, a little of the Dark Knight movies. Make it animated in a style reminiscent of Babar and the Nickelodeon version of Doug, and I think that's the best way to describe what Tintin was. The original comic book by Hergé revolved around a 20-something-year-old journalist named, well, Tintin, who is usually just minding his own business, but somehow or another gets involved in espionage, drug smugglings, political plots, kill all opponents' treasure hunts, and even an alien invasion once. Well, not so much an invasion as... Well, we'll get to that later. And about halfway through the series, he's joined by his new best friend and eventual housemate, Captain Haddock, a somewhat cranky and drunk, but mostly loyal and good-hearted sea captain, and always there for the two is the absent-minded but insanely smart Professor Calculus, the two dim-witted detectives, Thompson and Thompson, who really do have the best of intentions, but I think Ned Flanders put it best. The last case you got to the bottom of was a case of Malamars! And of course, his loyal dog, Snowy, who honestly is more level-headed than Calculus or the detectives combined, and together, the multitude of disturbingly cold-blooded villains they come across don't stand a chance, not even Tintin's archenemy, Rastapopolis. The comics have had its share of adaptations over the years, most recently from Steven Spielberg, but arguably the best known version was the early 90s series from Nelvana, which is hands down the most faithful to the comics, both story-wise and by keeping the more adult contents of the comics. Okay, they toned down the drinking, smoking, gun violence, and amount of deaths a bit, but not nearly as much as you'd think. Guess it was one of the perks of being an HBO series. But which episodes are the best? Which not only captured the spirit of Hergé's work best, but also were just the most engaging? Well, let me share with you what I think. These are the top 10 episodes of the Nelvana 1010 series. Admit it, you knew that awful pun was coming. Number 10. The Crab with Golden Claws. Besides being one of the two stories adapted for the movie, this episode is notable for being the debut of Captain Haddock. Apparently he was meant to be a one-time character, but was so popular he ended up becoming the secondary protagonist. So naturally, such a great character would warrant a great introduction. So is that what we have here? Let's find out. Tintin's strolling through town and can't understand why Snowy's so obsessed with what seems to be just a can of crab meat. That is until he discovers the same kind of can from a sailor who drowned last night and in the opening scene of the episode. So correctly guessing there might be more to the can he found earlier than meets the eye, he examines it and finds the word Karabushan written on it. But before he can guess what that means, a Japanese man whom said sailor was conversing with in the flashback before his drowning is kidnapped before he can give a message to Tintin. But Tintin smells trouble, and once he finds the Karabushan is a ship, he heads to the port and Tintin finds that there's a drug smuggling going on led by an enemy of his named Alan, whom Tintin had foiled another drug smuggling of that we'll talk about later. So they take him prisoner, but Tintin escapes and meets Haddock, whom Alan's been intoxicating so he can take helm of the ship with the drug operation. They escape in a lifeboat, and after a few mishaps, the two of them are... On the road to Morocco where the drug lord behind this operation resides. So to answer the question, is this episode a worthy introduction to one of the series' most popular characters? And for the most part, yes, it certainly is. For instance, this is one of the few episodes where Haddock's alcoholism for the comics is portrayed full-on. 
Well, almost. I was pretty disappointed they cut the part where Haddock sets fire to their lifeboat to warm them up, a scene thankfully restored in the Spielberg film. They also cut the scene where Haddock intend to get drunk on alcohol fumes, and changed Haddock knocking Tintin unconscious while they're on the plane because he won't let him have a turn flying to the bad guy knocking him unconscious. Okay, so it's not quite full on, but noticeably more present than most episodes. Hell, I'm surprised this scene from the comic slid by. A bottle of champagne! Ha ha ha! Confounded cork! On too tight! Captain! Well, even then, it's still pretty toned down compared to the original comic. But despite reducing Haddock's drunkenness, they do not reduce the drama at all. Hell, someone literally dies in the intro alone, and right when they're trying to reveal what looks like some really dire info, getting us all the more invested from the start. Uh, for the record, the drowned dude was a Caribougian sailor who had a change of heart, and was going to tattle on the crew to this Japanese policeman before the gang stepped in. And even throughout the episode, there's such exciting sequences, like the scene where they're being shot in their lifeboat by when the sailor sent to gun them down the ship's seaplane, them taking control of said plane and barely surviving flying it through a storm, Haddock's withdrawal slash desert madness, and the villains pretending their ship was lost at sea and changing the name on it so the authorities won't find this Kirabushian that Tintin and Haddock reported had drug smugglers on it. Speaking of the villains, this is the only episode where Alan is the main antagonist. Well, not technically, but the drug lord doesn't appear until the end, and it's so forgettable I remember the camels in Morocco more. But Alan actually is the one who's mainly orchestrating the operation as well as most of the attacks on our heroes, and he actually does make a pretty decent lead villain. How much does he know about the shipment? Enough to know you killed someone for it. You mean Dawes? <laughs> well, he wasn't the first, and he won't be the last, Mr. Tintin. I don't care how you do it, but get me Haddock alive! Yeah, this dude was always the villain's sidekick, even in the Spielberg adaptation. But after this episode, I would have loved to have seen more episodes with him as the big bad. But either way, while far from Tintin's greatest adventure, hell, it feels eerily similar to that other drug smuggling with Alan I mentioned earlier, which has a much higher spot on this list, but it's still a fun, exciting, and alcoholic introduction to our all-time favorite sea captain. After him. Number 9. The Calculus Affair. This one's going to be a bit shorter because the premise itself is somewhat limited, but this episode definitely makes the most of its limited premise. Not long after Haddock and Tintin become millionaires, how that came to be is for the next round though, they find everything made of glass in their new home, Marlin Spike Hall, is shattering for no apparent reason. That is until Professor Calculus, the absent-minded scientist who helps them acquire the treasure that made them rich, leaves for a physics convention in Geneva. And Tintin correctly guesses that the shattering was from one of Calculus's latest experiments, namely an ultrasonic device capable of mass destruction. That the secret agent dude seems pretty interested in getting his hands on. After finding out he's headed for the same hotel as Calculus, the two realize that they might be after him for said device and head out to warn him. But now the rest of the organization, namely from a fictitious country called Boldoria, are determined to make sure they don't get in the way of the kidnapping and begin a terroristic game of cat and mouse. So yeah, the rescue kidnap scientist trope was nothing new when the original comic was published, and certainly not when the episode adaptation was released in the early 90s. But cliches aside, the premise is still pretty well done, both comedically and dramatically. On the drama side, we got car chases, gun firings, the bad guy sending the hero's car into a river, nearly causing them to drown, Tintin climbing onto the wing of an airborne airplane to rescue Calculus, and get this, the Bordurians plant a bomb in the mansion of an ally Calculus was going to visit while Tintin and Haddock are there, I guess because he knows too much about Calculus' invention, but they really don't clarify that. Anyway, the bomb goes off, and the heroes still survive. Hell, they honestly don't even seem hurt all that bad. I tell ya, these guys are made out of iron. But this episode is just as comedic, partially from our leads being considerably more stupid than usual. Operation Rescue! Captain! Charge! Take this and that! We are working an undercover mission here in Switzerland, looking for Haddock and Tintin. To be precise, we've been incognito to find Tintin and Haddock in Switzerland. I see. 
You can tell by her expression alone that she's thinking, when the hell did Interpool start hiring Police Academy rejects? But the villains don't fear much better. All it takes is Tintin and Haddock putting on soldier disguises and saying the General gave orders to turn Calculus over to them to get him freed. Oh, and how do they neutralize the agents bugging their room at the hotel? By getting them drunk as hell! Yeah, having the heroes get too drunk like in the comics was vetoed by the Nelvana censors, but apparently it was perfectly fine for the villains. Also, some of the agents' attempts to kidnap Calculus feel like they're straight out of a Roadrunner and Wily e. Coyote short. Here he comes. Get ready. Morning, Professor. Would you like a lift into the village? No, thanks. But if you could drop me in the village, I'd be amused. By the whiskers of Curvitage, fold again! <laughs> So yeah, despite having one of the most cliched premises in all media, it was executed really damn well, making for a funny and exciting episode throughout. Oh yeah, fun fact, there's a scene where this annoying Lionel Hutz-like insurance agent invites himself into Marlin's bike and won't take no for an answer that's allegedly based on a real-life experience Hergé had. Just a bit of trivia. Next one. Number 8. The Secret of the Unicorn This story is notable for two things. One, being the other of the two original Tintin stories to be the basis for the 2011 film. And two, do you notice how in media, whenever a character does come across wealth or treasure, they almost always lose it by the end of the episode to maintain the status quo? Well, Hergé said, to hell with the status quo, if my protagonists get rich, I want them to stay that way. How rare and cool is that? Well, okay, it wasn't technically until the next installment, Red Rackham's Treasure, that they actually get rich and here at Haddock's ancestral home. But despite introducing Calculus, that one wasn't quite good enough to make the list. So let's talk about the episode that led to that less exciting installment. Tintin's at the flea market one day and buys a cool model ship called the Unicorn as a gift for Haddock. These two guys called Sakura and Barnaby also seem to really want the ship and each offer Tintin quite a bit for it. But Tintin makes it clear that the ship is not for sale. But then when his ship is stolen and placed ransacked shortly after, he starts to wonder if maybe there's something more to this ship than meets the eye. And after consulting with Haddock, he finds that there is. It's actually a model ship of the very ship a captain's great-grandfather, a respected sea captain called Sir Francis Haddock. Apparently Sir Francis had a run-in with a notoriously wicked pirate called Red Rackham, who hijacked said ship, killed his entire crew, but made the mistake of waiting till morning to kill the captain because... eh, Bond villain stupidity. So Sir Francis is able to get away, and after a pretty badass swashbuckle, sends the scurvy donk to Davy Jones' locker, as well as the rest of the pirate crew when he blows up and sinks the ship with them all on it. Once rescued after two years as a castaway, he decided to tell his three sons about the treasure in an Indiana Jones slash national treasure-like fashion, namely build three models of his sunken ship, the Unicorn, and put part of a treasure map to the location of the sunken ship and the booty in each of the three masts. And once Tintin and Haddock realize they have one mast and that saccharine dude has the other, the two BFFs decide it's time for an Indiana Jones-style treasure hunt. Only thing is, the owners of the third ship aren't quite as amicable. So yeah, I can definitely see why this was chosen by Spielberg as one of the two stories to adapt for the movie. I mean, if your main characters get rich and stay that way in the series, then an exciting adventure for how that's maintained is warranted, and that's mostly what we have here. One is its captivating mystery and effective use of red herrings. I love how the episode throws us off by making Saccharin seem so obviously like the culprit who steals Tintin's ship, since he seemed noticeably more obsessed with it than Barnaby, even stalking Tintin at his house, and, let's be honest, looks a lot more like your stereotypical cartoon villain. But then nope, he's just a harmless ship collector, and Barnaby turns out to to be the one who stole it, and also ransacked his place. Nice way to throw us off, Hergé. And of course, there's the flashback story Haddock tells us about Sir Francis. It takes almost half of the first part of the story, but that doesn't matter because it's literally that good. It's action-packed, rush-inducing, and has some of the best over-the-top adventure recapping since Mickey has the brave little tailor. I'm getting angry, Red Rackham! Ha ha! I've got ya now! Captain! Plus, talk about giving Haddock such a cool family history. 
And guess what else? Hergé throws us off even more. After making it seem like Barnaby is the villain, we learn that he was just an accomplice who's having a change of heart, but gets shot before he can say too much, but somehow survives and eventually rats the true villains out to the twins. Speaking of which, what about the true villains of the story, aka the Bird Brothers? Well, unfortunately, they are not the most memorable Tintin villains, not even by a long shot. They don't even appear until the third act, and even then, they're defeated pretty easily. And what's their backstory? They were artifact collectors who found out about the parchments and were willing to go to more immoral lengths to obtain the other pieces than Tintin and Haddock. And that said, their personalities honestly aren't much more interesting either, sad to say. The Spielberg film's interesting in that it drops the Bird Brothers and actually does make Saccharin the villain. Sure, it kind of defeats Hergé's purpose for the character, but never mind, because Saccharin is a ten times better villain than the Bird Brothers. He's ruthless, intimidating, occasionally funny. Do I pay you to talk to me? You don't pay me at all. And unlike the Bird Brothers, is motivated by more than just greed. He was actually a descendant of Red Rackham, which I guess makes sense seeing how much these two look alike, so he wants to reclaim his family treasure and avenge his ancestor. That's a way cooler motive. But regardless of having subpar villains, the story itself is a really engaging Indiana Jones-like adventure full of interesting twists, some awesome family history for our characters, and leading to the story that lets the main characters getting filthy rich and meeting Calculus. All I can really say is... Number 7 The Seven Crystal Balls Slash Prisoners of the Sun Again, I know I'm cheating a little, and there are other two-part stories on this list where I'll talk about one but not the other, but I just feel that these are two halves of a story that can't be properly discussed without the other, so cut me some slack here. Tintin and Haddock decide to relish their newfound wealth in high society by attending an elite magic show. One of the acts is an old friend of theirs, General Alcazar, who's moonlighting with his new friend Rupak. It's a pretty fun night, until a psychic tells a member of the audience that her husband's doomed to fall into a deadly illness that no one ever recovers from, and sure enough, said lady gets a message that her husband has come down with a deadly illness that no one ever recovers from. It turns out he was one of seven archaeologists who had recently turned from an expedition where they desecrated the tomb of an Incan emperor and took his corpse as well as an ancient text back to Europe with them, and once translated, said text was basically a prediction of this happening and that they'd have an inescapable divine curse fall upon them. Haddock's not convinced, but one by one, the remaining explorers fall into a coma, each by a broken window with some shattered crystal glass beside it, and despite the best efforts of Tintin, Haddock, and the authorities to keep the remaining members from suffering the same fate, the prophecy is eventually fulfilled with each member falling victim to the strange shattered glass, eventually finishing with Calculus' old friend, though they did kind of bring it upon themselves trying Thompson and Thompson as their bodyguards. Who's guarding his window? I am, of course. Then what are you doing out here? Great Scott! And when Calculus disappears after trying on the bracelet of said Emperor, the two manage to track the kidnappers on a ship to Peru, and their journey to follow them and rescue Calculus is what makes part two. So each part of the story is really engaging, just not quite in the same way. The Seven Crystal Balls is more of a horror mystery. The scenes where each archaeologist falls victim to the curse are really intense, and you're dying to know what the hell is causing this. Is it really an ancient curse, or is it all just a ruse? Though, the fact that one of the crystal balls literally falls on the chimney of the final victim and reclaims the course of the Emperor hints that it's the former. Either way, as much as you're hoping Tintin can save them, you know deep down they're all going to be claimed. Plus, there's some pretty effed up imagery to go with it. No. Looks like the audience at the Hollywood premiere of Evil Dead Rise. Prisoners of the Sun is more of an Indiana Jones-like adventure episode where the two are making their way to the Empire with the aid of a young orange seller named Zerino, but is still super action-packed. Like, I freaking love the scene where the kidnapper separates the train from the car and it goes rolling down the mountain with the two barely surviving. It really felt like a scene out of Indiana Jones. Or when these thieves kidnap Zerino and steal a lot of their supplies, Tintin and Haddock just kick the living shit out of them. So eventually they reach Calculus' kidnappers of the Temple of the Sun, and all is revealed. It was supernatural forces behind the attacks on the archaeologists, just not quite the way we expected. 
We learned that Alcazar's new stage partner was actually the tribe's witch doctor and followed them to Europe to inflict the supernatural payback on them for their sacrilege. I have to admit, I did not see that coming. I suspected it was the spirit of the Emperor, and I know you all did too. Don't you dare bullshit me. And they came up Calculus for his sacrilege of wearing the Emperor's bracelet. And thus he, Tintin, and Haddock will be executed. Though to be nice, they'll let them pick the date and time. Oh, how will they ever get out of this one? Easy. Tintin chooses the day and time of Solar Eclipse is forecasted so he can pretend that the Sun God is on his side and doesn't want them to be hurt. The tribe's fooled and per his terms for bringing the Sun back, let them go and lift the curse on the archaeologists. Herge, we did not deserve your extremely clever and creative writing. Zerino chooses to stay with the tribe and all's well that ends well. Really fantastic episode. Didn't change the course of the series or provide any deep character explorations. It was just a really exciting mystery slash horror slash adventure episode. Oh yeah, and also has the twins feeling pretty epically trying to track calculus on their own. Ooh, hmm. How peculiar. Yes. Quiet. Number 6 Red Sea Sharks No, this was not an inspiration for Jaws or anything. The sharks are only metaphorical, but just as vicious. Tintin and Haddock run to their old friend General Alcazar after an evening at the movies, who's acting somewhat strange. On top of that, Mr. Ratburn... Servant to His Highness Prince Abdullah, I bring you a message from my master. Or rather, his actor Arthur Holden, you know, back when white actors voicing non-white characters was acceptable, and tells him that his master and their friend, a Middle Eastern ruler named Amir, has been overthrown by his rival and is currently in hiding while his country is at war. Oh yeah, and he sent his bride son Abdullah to stay with them for his safety, and pretty much says that if he does die, then they're his legal guardians. Which they don't look forward to since the kid is making their lives hell on Earth. But soon bigger problems start to emerge. Thompson Thompson questioned Tintin about his encounter with Alcazar last night, but can't tell him why. My dear fellow, if you imagine we tell you that he's smuggling aircraft, you're much mistaken. Or that we tell you that General Alcazar is mounting a counter-revolution after Tapioca redeposed him. You can forget it! Hey, for once the detective's idiocracy worked in Tintin's favor. And upon investigation, we find he's buying said weapons from Dawson, this corrupt cop involved in a drug smuggling Tintin thwarted in China. Oh yeah, and he's also selling them to the general who overthrew Amir. Small world. So unable to stand what a little shit Abdullah is any longer, I mean, uh, knowing their friend is in trouble and that there's another smuggling operation at works, how to and Tintin decide to head to the Middle East and save the day as usual? But the two soon find that Dawson's not the only adversary of theirs in on this scheme. We got several other Badams in on this as well, like General Mueller, Allen, and Rastapopoulos, and they all want vengeance on Tintin as much as Dawson. So yeah, this episode is kind of that all the main villains team up story, which I'm sure you know is kind of hit or miss in media, especially in cartoons, and here it's done reasonably well. On the negative side, the plot is a little hard to follow. Hell, it took me a few rewatches to fully understand the plot and each villain's involvement with such. And yeah, I can see kids having a bit of difficulty following this one too. But once you do get the gist of it, it's a pretty ballsy and action-packed episode throughout. Yeah, it's clear that all of Tintin's foes want to inflict some pretty bodily harm on this redhead for all the shit he's caused them with their previous schemes. We have Dawson planting a bomb on Tintin's plane, which they only survived because one of the plane wings happened to catch fire, forcing them to crash land and evacuate before the explosion went off. We got Mueller and his force chasing our heroes with aircraft and machine guns. And thankfully his gunsmen are as dumb as Thompson and Thompson. What the oaks? You'll be court-martialed! Dismissed! Raised to the X! I'll have you shot! And yeah, let's talk about Rastapopoulos, currently posing as a free-loving millionaire named the Marquis de Gorgonzola. This dude is easily the most cold-blooded villain in the entire Tintin franchise. Well, up until his final appearance, but we'll get into that a bit later. So previously, this guy was running a drug cartel in the Middle East and China that, again, we'll go more into later. And whenever he doesn't kill somebody, he has them injected with a poison that turns them mentally insane, and inflicted this upon the Chinese Emperor's son and planned to have him kill Tintin and his own parents while under the influence of the stuff. Yeah, you see how cruel this guy can be? So what's the dude's plan this time? 
Well, there's a reason he wants to overthrow Amir and help his rival take over, because... Get this! He's currently running a scam where he charges refugees an arm and a leg to transport them to safety, and then just drowns them in the ocean once he has their valuables. Yeah, there is a place in hell for someone like this. And where Amir was going to put a stop to this, his rival couldn't care less. But guess what? There's more. Once Tintin and Haddock are coincidentally rescued by the same ship Rastapopolis is on, he opts to have them transported to said refugee ship, which is currently captained by Alan, and set fire to it to burn Tintin and Haddock to a crisp along with the refugees. Yeah, drowning them was bad enough, now he's gonna barbecue them just because Tintin and Haddock were on board. Of course they managed to put it out, but we got an epic showdown where Rastapopolis goes psycho and tries torpedoing the ship in a submarine, and fails, but gets away in a miniature James Bond-like submarine. Yes, this dude is pure evil, but good god is he cool. The very ending is a little disappointing, though. Tintin and Haddock ultimately aren't the ones who save Amir and foil the political plot in his country. It's just revealed at the end that he somehow did it on his own, and don't ask me what happened to Doss and Mueller Tapioca. Yeah, it seems like Hergé got a bit lazy, and rather than finding a way to tie the finale with Rastapopoulos to the big political plot, he just decided, eh, let's have someone else take care of it. But that's a very minor issue in what's otherwise a very exciting and action-packed collaboration of the majority of Tintin's archenemies, and ultimately shows that not even working together can they stop this 20-something-year-old reporter turned millionaire from saving the day. Plus, we learn that Abdullah may have a bit of a heart after all. I am a bit sad to leave because it was fun at Marlin Spike. Isn't that sweet? You know, he wasn't such a bad kid after... Blue blistering barnacle! <laughs> yeah, and monkeys might fly out of my butt. Number 5 Tintin in America Hergé did indeed take our heroic redhead to many places across the world, but only once did he ever bring him here to the land of the free and the home of the brave. Scotland! No! America! Yeah, you tell her, Rocky. Specifically to do an expose on the severe crime wave that's hit 1930 Chicago, but he's having a bit of writer's block. But soon more problems emerge, as Al Capone, fearing Tintin's expose will drive potential victims away from coming to Chicago, orders his second-in-command, Smiles, to take care of the kid. But when every attempt he makes feels miserably, and Tintin's able to put Smiles and half of Capone's gang behind bars in less than a week, Capone decides it's time to take matters into his own hands. Okay, so first of all, Tintin goes up against the most famous gangster in all history and beats the living crap out of him. Well, I'm speaking metaphorically, but still, how awesome is that? Not to mention, it's also pretty cool to see him go up against a real-life bad guy from history. But what's really ironic about this episode is, despite featuring a real-life criminal in a somewhat down-to-earth scenario, these gangsters feel a lot more like James Bond villains. I admit that I'm not a huge Chicago gangster expert, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have cars that imprisoned its passengers, trap doors that lead into pits with knockout gas, and especially not two doors, one leading to safety and the other to death. Yes, it's a bit silly, but does anyone really give a shit? It's fun seeing Al Capone operating like Dr. Evil. But silliness aside, this episode can be pretty dark, too. Aside from having some of the show's most explicit gun violence, Capone's thugs are every bit as cold-blooded as their real-life counterparts. Just make sure you don't miss. I never miss, Mr. Smiles. I thought you were taking care of this guy, Smiles. Uh, I am, boss. Trust me. Everything's under control. It better be. Or you're next, see? Wow, Capone was so intimidating, he was apparently able to cause people to sprout mustaches in fear. Plus, there are a few times when they actually come the closest any villain has ever come to finishing off Tintin, especially when they kidnap Snowy. But Tintin really deserves credit for how much of a badass he can be against these monsters. I'll make it worth your while, Mr. Tintin. Say, $200,000? Of course, if you decide not to accept my offer, then I'll be forced to make you leave in a less pleasant way. I don't like bribes or threats, Mr. Smiles. I'll leave Chicago when I'm ready, after I'm finished my story. My only real gripe with this episode is that the characters can be a bit... 
well, stupid at times. Like, one of Smile's plots to eliminate Tintin is to have some of his goons come and pretend to be cops who want Tintin to come downtown with them and sign a complaint about the gangster he just apprehended. And yeah, they're about as genuine of cops as they probably sound. Not even when they reach the police headquarters as Tintin winds up. Not till it's too late, anyway. But the gangsters aren't always the sharpest knives in the drawer, either. I mean, seriously, a truck loaded with millions of dollars with no police escort? Doesn't sound even a wee bit suspicious? But these moments are relatively small and don't detract on the whole from how awesome it is to see Tintin go up against America's most notorious gangster and have Jose go Quentin Tarantino by defying history and having Tintin defeat this dude once and for all. Number 4 Tintin in Tibet This episode's strength doesn't come from its humor or tension like the majority of Tintin episodes, but rather its heart. Not that there weren't some heartfelt moments in the series prior, but this episode... Well, let's just look. Tintin and Haddock are on vacation in the French Alps, and Tintin gets a letter from Chang, this boy Tintin met while foiling Rastapopoulos' drug dealership in China, is coming to visit. Tintin psyched! Until Haddock reveals that Chang's plane crashed into Tibet and no survivors were found. But the thing is, Tintin's been having dreams for the past several nights that his friend is injured and calling out to him for help. So believing these have been prophetic dreams, Tintin decides he's gotta go to Tibet and rescue his friend, despite everyone telling him that's wishful thinking and there's no way the kid could have survived. But despite the doubters, nothing is going to stop our favorite redhead from finding his friend, not even a yeti. So yeah, this is one of those stories, you know, that only one person believes their family or friends survive and won't stop no matter how much everyone tries to talk them out of it story. Yeah, this was super cliched even when the original comic was published back in 1959, but the thing is, there's a reason this premise is super cliched. Because admit it, it's really sweet to see someone not give up hope that their family or friend is still out there. And especially if it's executed really well, the cliché can never grow old, especially when it leads to a bunch of I TOLD YOU SO BITCHES in a really sweet reunion. And thankfully, it's more than well executed here. Tintin just has this undying loyalty to Chang. He makes it clear that he is going to find out if the kid is alive or not, and nothing is going to stop him. And naturally, per the cliché, everyone around him tells him he's completely nuts. Haddock, Chang's uncle, and even the wise monastery monks. The love you show is noble but foolish. The mountains of Tibet keep those they take. But Tintin says, F it, I'm finding Chang. But Tintin's not the only one who shows supreme loyalty here. Even though he doesn't fully believe him, Haddock's really moved by Tintin's love for Chang, as willing to stick by his best friend throughout the supposedly impossible quest. Even when the other members of the search party chicken out, and Haddock almost does once or twice as well, he ultimately is right beside Tintin, as is their mountain guide, until he gets injured and can't go any further. And in case you're wondering, yes, Chang is alive. I mean, when is cliché is that not the case? Okay, fair answer, but that was kind of obvious here on account of the fact that they found his name carved in stone earlier and Tintin found a scarf. But while mostly strong on account of its heart, this episode is not without some drama and humor as well. Yeah, there's kind of a reason everyone's been trying to talk Tintin out of this quest. Going up in the Tibetan mountains in freezing weather is super dangerous. Hell, Tintin and Snowy almost freeze to death at one point and Tintin even falls into a supposedly bottomless pit. That thankfully turns out to have a slope that one can easily come up from. What are the odds? Plus, just look at the frickin' Yeti. Yeah, I guess there's a reason the monks describe this thing as being out of hell. I wonder if her shame might have been taking some of Rastapopoulos' opium when designing the beast. But I know for a fact that Haddock was when he has these hallucinations early in the quest. It seems I've lost my umbrella. Why, I've got plenty. Don't be silly, it's a hot pepper. Yeah. yeah, heat exhaustion my ass, he's on some pretty hard drugs there. Plus, we get even more hilarity with animals getting drunk. No, Snowy, it's bad. Be quiet. Try it. Admit it, you all wanted to see Snowy listen to his devil and get completely tanked, even if it did almost get him drowned. I think the last interesting thing I want to note is, the Yeti actually turns out to be nice and was the one who rescued Chang and sustained him these last two weeks. I gotta admit, I did not see that coming. 
I mean, who could with this thing? Nice job, Hershey. Speaking of Hershey, this story is notable for taking a lot of stress off the dude's plate. Apparently he was having some major psychological depression at the time when he was caught in a love triangle with his wife and one of his own employees and having nightmares from guilt with White Snow, but instead of retiring like his shrink suggested, he decided to use said nightmares for his next album, as well as a way to give him hope that he'd be reunited one day with his own Chinese friend whom Chang was based off of, and it led to his personal favorite Tintin story ever. And while it's not my personal one, I do love it a lot. It's such a great story about how true platonic friends never give up on each other until they know for a fact they're done for, no matter what anyone says. But with some intense drama and hilarious comedy sprinkled here and there, it's a Hershey masterpiece indeed. Number 3 Flight 714 you know that one piece of a franchise that just says, to hell with logic and continuity, let's just take some mushrooms and do whatever the hell we want? Well, this is when Hershey made that decision, and the results are... mostly satisfactory. Tintin, Haddock, and Calculus are off to a space exploration conference in Sydney, Australia, probably for being the first men on the moon, which we'll go into a bit later, semi-spoiler. Anyway, they meet this obsessive compulsive millionaire named Laszlo Kuratis, who takes a liking to the gang, and since he happens to be heading to said conference as well, invites him to ride with him on his luxury private plane to the event, which happens to be piloted by an old friend of the gang, Scud. But Tintin's growing suspicious since most of the original crew had accidents the previous day and were replaced by some pretty shady looking folks, and Kratos' valet is also acting pretty suspicious. And big shock, they lock up the passengers and the only good pilot on board and reroute the plane to an uncharted island that's the new base of the dreaded Rastapopolis, who plots to use a truth serum to get Kratos' bank information, only to learn that they may not be quite alone on this island. So yeah, this is hands down the craziest installments of the franchise. Let's first talk about its very interesting portrayal of some of the franchise's most intimidating villains. Rastapopoulos goes from almost making Hannibal Lecter look nice to the bad guy of an Animaniacs episode. Loudmouth, hot-headed, dumb as bricks, prone to constant slapstick torture, and even dressing like an over-the-top cowgirl, it's pretty clear his days as the franchise's most heinous villain were pretty well behind him especially when he ends up getting injected with the truth serum himself. Don't cry. You couldn't possibly be as bad as me. What are you talking about? I'm better than you. Or not, am too. Or not, am too. Tell him cruel spell. Tell him I'm the baddest. He's the... Tell him how I was going to shoot you after I got the account number. He was... What? Tintin, you know me. Tell him I'm the baddest. Are not. I am. <laughs> He's such a bitch. <laughs> Alan, another one of the series' most cold-blooded villains, is pretty much the sure boss, whatever you say, lackey here. Kind of like how he was portraying the Spielberg film. Come to think of it. On the one hand, you may find this a total jump-the-shark moment for the series like a lot of critics did at the time, but here's the thing, this was intentional on Hergé's part. Apparently Hergé was starting to grow bored with the series, but it was too profitable to throw the towel in just yet, so once he realized how ridiculous his choice of outfit was for Rastapopoulos, this was when he decided to just go with it and make the story that one bizarre weird episode with pathetic villains and some interesting sci-fi… well, one thing at a time. And I honestly can't get too mad at this because it's super funny. It's like South Park's Osama Bin Laden wears farty pants. They turn a horrible inhuman bastard whose crimes are an abomination into the biggest imbecile imaginable. Unfortunately, the third act is when the story starts to get a bit disappointing. The millionaire Kratos is admittedly pretty funny for the most part. The account number 2, 10, 35. Finally! Yep, from my eldest sister's handbag. Two hundred and ten dollars and thirty-five cents! <laughs> oh, she never suspected me for one moment! But eventually he gets so annoying that even Calculus can't stand him. Who's the baddest now? <laughs> I'm the baddest, I am, I am, I'm the baddest, I am. You help me. He was going to kill me. The baddest I am. Shut up! 
Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! And now for the finale. The gang eventually finds a German accent alien who claims to be a field researcher of Earth to his own planet for thousands of years, kind of like Pleakley and Lilo and Stitch. Anyway, he rescues the gang when the island volcano erupts, but says that human life isn't ready to know of aliens yet, and pulls a men in black on them. Besides, that sort of nonsense would never affect us. Affect us. Affect us. I have mixed feelings about this finale. On the one hand, the ending perfectly fits the bizarre nature of the story, plus I think this was the start of the erase all memory of aliens trope, don't know for a fact though, but I do think Hergé could have tied the aliens relevance to the story better, other than telepathically communicating with Tintin a few times to lead him to safety, the Martian subplot comes completely out of nowhere and has really nothing to do with the story overall. I don't know, maybe I'm being a little too nitpicky, and maybe Hergé did that on purpose to give it a random feel but I still feel it would have been neat to learn more about the alien ambassador and their planet. So yeah, this episode has some flaws, but the good largely outshines the bad. It gave Rastapopoulos the mocking he so rightly deserved, not to mention had him abducted by the aliens at the end, ending his threat once and for all, and ends with a somewhat forced but still delightfully bizarre alien rescue and memory erasure, thus concluding an adventure that only our friend Snowy will remember to tell. If only he could speak. Number 2 Cigars of the Pharaoh This one is a really interesting piece. Besides being the introduction of Tintin's archenemy Rastapopoulos, although we don't find out he's the villain until the next issue, The Blue Lotus, an episode sadly not quite good enough to make the list, it's also the introduction of Thompson Thompson in... Honestly, it's just a really exciting mystery episode with some really uffed up imagery. Tintin and Snowy are on a much needed cruise and run to an eccentric archaeologist named Dr. Sarcophagus. Ain't that a neat name? The two bond and Tintin's invited to join them on his latest expedition uncovering the lost tomb of some pharaoh, who many archaeologists prior have attempted to uncover, but none have returned, allegedly due to an ancient curse. And of course Tintin's in! But even though he's just met our heroic redhead, an unidentified Rastapopoulos can tell he's trouble and has him framed for drug smuggling. Tintin escapes and resumes his expedition with the dock, but the two soon get separated and Tintin finds a tomb with the bodies of the missing archaeologists, including some interestingly pre-prepared coffins. Oh boy. But thankfully, Tintin's able to get away again and finds the sailors weren't just smuggling bodies out with these coffins. Yeah, it's those drugs we've seen constantly thus far. This was when they first appeared. But the gang knows Tintin's onto them and are determined to stop him at any cost. All while the detectives are still hot on his tail thinking he's the ringleader. So what's this episode's strength? Well, for starters, it's easily one of the most complex narratives in the Tintin franchise and gives us a pretty good Scooby-Doo-like mystery. But before we get into that, let's talk about how it's probably the most dark and disturbing piece of the franchise. Again, we see the bodies of the archaeologists whom the gang had killed before they could uncover the operation. And if that's not disturbing enough, just look at the side effects of the knockout gas the gang plants. No! Okay, that had to have been the opium. That could not have just been frickin' knockout gas. Plus, just look at this guy. Surrender. Yeah, sweet dreams, kids. And just for the cherry on top, look at the outfits of these cult members. It's like if the Ku Klux Klan became devil worshippers. But are neither of these outfits nor the fact that these are drug dealers enough for you? Well, don't forget that whenever Rastapopoulos' cult doesn't kill someone who knows too much, like Sarcophagus, they inject them with a poison that drives them mentally insane. Grand has played much more for laughs here than in the Blue Lotus. I'm Pharaoh Ramses II, ruler of all the Nile! Da, 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 I am the Lizard Queen! 
But it's still pretty freaking disturbing. But thankfully, the disturbing content does make the story all the more engaging. And as for the mystery of the operation and its members, it's done fairly well. Some members are painfully obvious, like Alan and the crazy hypnotic SOB, but others... Not so much. Like, Tintin runs into this house mostly full of old people who seem like they wouldn't hurt a fly, and even tell Tintin where he can get sarcophagus mental help, writing a note to give to the doctor, which says to apprehend Tintin as the insane one. I honestly did not see that coming. They honestly seemed completely genuine. I also didn't suspect the gunman who wanted Tintin executed at dawn for spying. Anyway, I think the last interesting thing to note here is the detectives. Being one of the earlier works where Hergé was still finding these characters, Thompson and Thompson are no so smarter here than they would later be. Well, for the most part, anyway. For one, they're able to track the cruise ship Tintin's on to arrest him when they think he's a drug dealer, and later, when Tintin's set to be executed at dawn, they disguise themselves as Arabian gals there to spring him out, so they can deal with him legally themselves. Again, I did not see that coming at all, because that's something that would be way beyond the level of competency these two would later show. And get this, they rescued Tintin for a change instead of the other way around. I bet a lot of you were expecting the Blue Lotus to be on the spot, or, well, anywhere on this list, seeing how I've mentioned it far more than this episode. But I'm sorry, other than the ending and the fact that it properly introduces Rastapopolis and Shang, I just don't think it's especially memorable. Well, aside from these unflattering Asian stereotypes that I'm honestly flabbergasted we're allowed to stay in the Nelvana series. But honestly, Cigars of the Pharaoh is just a much better story, full of unexpected twists and surprises, rare competency of the detectives, and some of the most disturbing imagery Tintin's offered. And that's why it, rather than Blue Lotus, earned second place on this list. And the number one Tintin episode is... Explorers on the Moon Remember how Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon? Well, not in the Herge universe. Here that honor goes to his iconic character in what's easily his biggest adventure ever, not just because it's a literal out-of-this-world one, but just about every minute there's something exciting, intense, surprising, completely insane, or all of the above happening, and that makes it such an engaging episode from start to finish. So what's the story? Tintin, Snowy, Haddock, Calculus, and Calculus' new colleague Wolf are set to make the first voyage to the moon. How they got chosen for said honor is another story, though, that wasn't quite good enough to make the list, unfortunately. But once they're in orbit, they find Thompson and Thompson are on board. You, you just told us the launching was scheduled for 1.34 p.m., right? A.M. Not P.M. A.M. Oh yeah, and the rocket was only equipped with enough oxygen for four people and a dog, not six, so... They gotta figure something out quick. See what I mean? Just in the beginning alone, the story's taking a pretty dark turn, but that's just the start. We got the twins accidentally turning off the artificial gravity, Haddock getting intoxicated and deciding to abandon the rocket and go back to Earth, with Tintin having to rescue him and bring him back to his senses. You know, it really sucks that they toned out Haddock's alcoholism in the series, because it's pretty freaking hilarious, isn't it? Oh, did I mention this is happening all while they're headed for an asteroid that they'll be drawn into if they don't rescue Haddock and get the rocket out of the way in time? And they eventually have to take evasive action while Haddock and Tintin are still outside the rocket, with the two hanging on for dear life. Oh yeah, and right after that, the detectives get into some of Calculus's chemicals that have some... very interesting effects on their hair growth. And keep in mind, all this happens before they reach the moon. Once they land, things get even crazier. Okay, from here on out, there are some massive spoilers ahead. So if you continue watching, don't you dare say I didn't warn you about what's coming up next. So it turns out the detectives weren't the only stowaways on board. It turns out that Jorgen... No, not that Jorgen. 
This is Colonel Boris Jorgen, an old enemy of Tin Tins. And apparently, Wolf's been in league with him all along, and the two are planning to fly the rocket back to Jorgen's home country of Soldalvia and leave the others on the moon to die, since again, there's not enough oxygen for all of them. But thankfully, Tin Tins able to thwart them as usual, and Wolf gets a chance to explain himself. Apparently, he was an addicted gambler in severe debt, and Jorgen offered to cover his broke ass if he told him about the secret project he was working on. So he did, but then Jorgen blackmailed him into smuggling him on board the rocket with the threat of exposing his gambling addiction to the public, but promised he wouldn't hurt anyone. And he believed him. The others naturally don't think that's a good excuse, but since they'd be no better than them if they left them on the moon to die, they let them come along. And just listen to how Jorgen escapes. You have two brilliant colleagues behind those mustaches. <laughs> They wanted to change our ropes for handcuffs. You are so goddamn stupid, it's unbelievable. Sorry, detectives, but he's absolutely right. You guys couldn't even be meter mates. But thankfully, Jorgen gets shot in a scuffle with Wolf, and right when their oxygen is starting to run out. And then we get one of my favorite moments in all of Tin Tin. So later, Wolf sneaks out, seemingly to do more harm right under Thompson's huge nose. I, I think there's another cylinder of oxygen down there. Oh, good. I had to ask, you see. The captain told me to give him details of every single move you made. Are you guys sure you didn't cheat your way through the police academy? But then... By the time you read this, I shall have left the rocket. I hope you'll have enough oxygen to reach Earth alive. Wolf, he cut the wires so that the engines wouldn't stop when he opened the doors. He jumped into space to save our lives. Did you find the scoundrel? If you ever say a disrespectful remark about Wolf again, I'll send you into space to join him. Got it? All I can really say to one of the deepest moments in the whole Tintin series is... Wow. And honestly, this doesn't feel forced at all. Wolf clearly showed guilt for his actions throughout the episode, so it's believable his guilt would lead him to such a selfless sacrifice. See what I mean? Hasn't this been an amazing episode or what? And it's all topped off with the gang being to the very last of their oxygen when they're just 20 minutes away from Earth and everyone but Tintin passing out. In the last few minutes where he tries to set the rocket to autopilot while barely conscious before passing out himself is some really intense shit. You know they're gonna be okay, but the drama's as intense as the destruction of Alderaan here. And thankfully, they just barely make it back to Earth alive, and with some medical oxygen, they're okay. By now, I highly doubt that Spielberg's Tintin 2 is ever going to come into fruition, but if it ever does, I really hope that this is the story they choose to adapt. Tintin may have had many awesome adventures on Earth, but her chase is the most exciting, action-packed, and emotional one for Out of This World. If there's one thing I learned from all this, man's proper place is on the Earth. Ha, 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 ha